We talked last time about uh, transport of contaminants. Um, if we recap things, uh, which I'll do in a second, um, before we talk about solving the equations that we derived. Um, uh, but basically, we end up with uh, a set of equations, or an equation for transport. And, well, actually, I don't want to write the equation again. It's, it serves no real purpose. But, oh, there. but the bottom line is that we can define some... Oh, let's do that. So I'm going to do what we did last time. The bottom line is that we end up with a, an expression that allows us to say something about how concentration, concentration changes with time as a function of two processes. One related to, well, my handwriting just seems phenomenal today. Um, perhaps only because it's been so bad in the past. Um, well, I'll just write this out before I start prattling on about it. So the advection dispersion equation, it's a plus, not a minus. I think that's pretty nice. I'm impressed by myself. This is our advection diffusion equation. I'm even going to underline it. Oh, that's fantastic too. That's not so good. And if you look in, if you think about looking at a plume in a plan view, where you have x and y Fine. and you had, say, a little hazardous waste site here that you're looking down on, then you'd think that the plume would end up looking a bit like this. If you drew a contour around a concentration of concentration is equal to uh, 1 ppm, whatever. And then inside this would be 10 ppm, just to give you some feel for this. And so the important thing about this expression, I'm not going to belabor the, we're not going to, we're going to use solutions to these expressions so we can actually say something about what these plumes will look like. The important things to realize are that there's some attached to this, there's some uh, velocity in the x direction, which we have here. The velocity in the y direction is zero, because this is the principal velocity, the main maximum velocity in the system. And we've talked about what these terms represent before. This is um, capacitance on the left-hand side. This is uh, dispersion. or diffusion. In the longitudinal direction, I guess I should, I should extend that. Both of these are, are that. And this is transverse. And this is longitudinal. And if you look at the plume, then the spreading that you see is really due to two things. This is uh, transverse spreading. This is longitudinal spreading. And if you like, um, the other thing that's apparent here is that 
this center of mass you could think of being uh, advecting downstream. And so though, I guess those really are the, the key processes. We have diff diffusion and dispersion, and we have advection. And so that's, we don't necessarily need the equation, but we talked about physically what it, it represents last time. And I think we'll probably end up talking about that again this time. But we also, I guess the other thing that we did was that we noted that this is advective velocity. And we know that the advective velocity is equal to the Darcy velocity divided by porosity. And the Darcy velocity we know is hydraulic conductivity times head gradient, if we wanted to calculate it, for instance. So we can always, presumably we can get that if we know something about measuring heads in boreholes and knowing something about permeability. And I think we know something about how to get permeability from uh, Van Genuchten relations, for instance. And the other part is dispersion. And so So the other part is we defined dispersion as two components. Well, longitudinal transverse. And the longitudinal is the part which is due to diffusion, which we call D star, which is the chemical spreading of the, um, the ink drop in water, modified for the fact that it has to, this tortuous flow path. And so I think um, D star was something like a tortuosity factor multiplied by the uh, molecular diffusion. In, you know, so diffusion coefficient of oil in water, uh, not oil, of salt in water is one number. And if you have a porous medium that gives it some tortuosity, those are the terms that go into this. So just dependent on the fluid that it's in, water containing salt in a beaker, this is for the tortuosity of the fact that it has to go along this tortuous path. And the so this is diffusion plus mechanical dispersion. And this mechanical dispersion we said last time that we can set it equal to a coefficient which we call alpha, multiplied by the advective velocity. And so, and likewise, this is of longitudinal dispersion. And if this is transverse, then it exactly mirrors this. The same diffusion amount is really not directional uh, or dependent on velocity. A different magnitude of this diff diffusivity, um, dis dispersivity, I think it is. I always get mixed up. And again, the advective velocity. And I think the parting shot was that, as we said last time, that this value surprised two things. The units of this, well, this is meters squared per second. So length squared over time. So the units of this have to be diffusion coefficient is meter squared per second. If you get it from a, uh, a reference book, uh, you know, mechanical engineering reference book, whatever. And this term also has to be uh, same units. This is units of length over time. So by definition, this has to be 1 over, sorry, thank you. Meters, yeah, it'd be a good idea. This has to be meters. So they're, they're uniform. And it turns out that, uh, we don't need to know this yet, but this value is actually equal to typically the length of the plume divided by 3 or 10. Surprising number. Transverse value, 
may be equal to the length of the plume divided by 10. Interesting that it's not related in any way to the material that you're flying through, but just the size of how big the plume is. Let's not get sidetracked by that now for purposes. And so the, the bottom line is that these properties control exactly what the plume would look like. And in terms of getting a feel for what this evolving plume would look like, depends something on these properties. Um, we spent some time talking about that last time. We had these figures depending on if we have plug flow. We know that plug flow will just work through here. This represents a value of d sub l, which equals what? These values represent increasing values. So in other words, this is dl, in my terminology, increasing as you go in this direction. So this is 0. This is a small number of dl, a bigger number, bigger, bigger, etc. It depends what the boundary condition is. If the boundary condition is set so that it, you turn on the material and you keep on injecting that same uh, mass loading in the water, then this is the boundary condition that you have, and it would be comp continuously, continuously re re replenished from upstream, and so the shape of it would be this. If it's just a pulse, so you have a small amount of, if you inject a small amount of water with salt in it at some location in a syringe and then go away, then this would be the behavior you'd expect to see, that it physically is turned on, and then you're not putting any more in the ground, and so it just merrily go down with this spike moving in the system. And so the behaviors of this are controlled by these properties. And the only two important properties for us to remember are how far this has gone in a given time is going to be equal to, if velocity is equal to length over time, then this length is just going to be equal to advective velocity times time. Maybe. You've used that already. But we'll see whether that really is true. And if this is true, then you'd have this um, slug flow, or plug flow rather, a slug moving through. And if you have a value of dispersion, which is bigger than zero, then you'd have it affected in some way. So you can always maybe get the 50% mark from this. This is the ordinate of the 50% mark that goes through here. But as we'll find out today, that's not always true. Some cases that we can't use that, and so that's just giving you a physical understanding of uh, of what we've, we've talked about. So that's kind of the expression that controls uh, what's going on. Yes. When we talked about um, like how maps in Indianapolis, like how they would when they travel through the soil, they would leave like a smear behind. Mm -hmm. Does that ever happen with uh, stuff that's dissolved in water or aqueous stuff? It does. It'll sorb onto the, the grain surfaces. Uh, it's not a very big deal for um, things like sands, which are quartz, uh, but it might be a big deal for things which have organic material in it by sorption. So in other words, some of it will come out of the flow field and get attached onto just the, the mono layer, uh, not, not as, just get attached onto the solid, and so it's removed from the flow field, and so it's attached to it. But if you then flush it with clean water, then you'll actually reverse desorb it. So it's a mechanism by which you could imagine reducing the concentration in the flow field initially, but actually giving a much longer duration of that concentration, because when you flush it out with clean water, as the aquifer is getting cleaner, then you still have this residual stuff sorbed on from these So yeah, it can sort of yeah. And we'll talk about that. It's much more of an issue for these organic components. So. We've talked about organic material existing as free phase as napples. They dissolve and then get carried downstream. They're, they, they're, they're, uh, they like organic material, and so they will sorb into organic carbon that exists in the soil, typically, and then desorb in the same way. And so we'll talk about that in the All right, so these are the coefficients that define this behavior. So a dispersion coefficient, an advective velocity, transverse dispersion coefficient. And of course, because this magnitude is smaller than this, if it's controlled by 
mechanical dispersion. That's why a plume would look kind of this elliptical shape. Most dispersed in the direction which is flowing and less dispersed in the direction perpendicular to that. This is the velocity in the direction of flow, x, because the velocity in the y direction is zero, right? The average velocity in the y direction is zero, because this is the principal flow velocity. So orthogonal to that maximum flow velocity, the velocity has to be zero. So this has to be, this isn't the value of flow velocity in this direction, it's the flow in this direction. And so that's, those are the parameters that we might want to use. All right, so that's the equation. We can put them all together. We can end up with these um, expressions. This is exactly uh, the expression, this equation here is a two-dimensional case that we looked at. Longitudinal dispersion, transverse dispersion, advective term, including the advective velocity and concentration gradient, and the rate of accumulation. Exactly the same things we've talked about. So what we might like to do is, in reality, if this was our site and this was our place where we had a well, we might be interested in knowing what the residence time distribution looked like or what the plume looked like as it approached us. And so we'd want to be able to solve in some way this partial differential equation, in which case we could invite the guy back from uh, Math 251 who's just in here to give us a brief uh, recap on that, or we could just take it on trust that you still remember this stuff. You're not going to need it here. You won't use it. Uh, but we will use some solutions to be able to look at the behavior. And um, solutions come in a variety of different flavors. Uh, and they're written about really the, the two, maybe there are th three flavors you could think of. The, the very simple ones are the one that we just talked about in terms of understanding exactly what the behavior is in terms of what we think it physically is. And that is that it would have traveled this far downstream and the concentration, the, the location of the 50% concentration would be at that point. And qualitatively, we could get some idea about what larger dispersions would mean. So just back of the envelope type calculations, that's not bad for us to be able to use that, as long as we realize when it can't uh, apply. So that's the first one. Maybe back of the envelope calculations is uh, the first one that we should do. The second one would be analytical solutions. So in other words, where you take the PDE that we just talked about, and we solve it for uh, a very simple geometry, which might be flowing down um, a core, and uh, use that. And the other ones would be where we take a very complicated site that might have different permeabilities at different locations, and lenses of materials, and different beds, and you try and encapsulate all of those behaviors in one place, in which case you can't solve it in one step and show it on a single plot. Uh, you'd have to use a numerical solution to do it. And so those are the three things that we've talked about. We've talked already about the back of the envelope calculation. Uh, we'll talk a bit later about numerical solutions, but today we'll talk about the ways of being able to solve this for really idealized uh, geometries. Let's see that. And so the idealized geometry that we'll work with um, it's typically going to be, if we drew it out, I suppose it might be this uh, smear zone that we have. And we have water traveling downstream at some advective velocity. And we'd be curious to know exactly with time what the plume looks like that develops from that. We've seen this kind of uh, schematic figure before. We'd like to know exactly what this plume looks like. We might also be interested to know when is it going to arrive at this point in terms of what might, for instance, be this RTD curve, residence time distribution. So in other words, when is it going to arrive and in what concentration? I could write larger, I suppose. So one way to, to represent this, instead of representing it as just this geometry here, which is the ground surface, the smear zone, I guess the water table would have to be at the ground surface as well, right, for this to be flowing in this way, is we could take it as a core, 
and think of the aquifer as being some length in the x-direction. Uh, L being the place where we evaluate the compliance point, right? where we figure out exactly what the concentration is. And that within this flow part here, we have some velocity in the x-direction, which is an advective velocity. I suppose we'd have some kind of dispersion coefficient, d sub l. And then we'd represent it by this, uh, this equation. Oops, that was just a random. So we could represent this. So this is the equation we're trying to deal with. This is our advective velocity, as we've defined before. Uh, this is the flow in the x direction. This is our geometry. We could imagine a variety of different um, boundary conditions. And actually, let's only let's not worry about the second one at all. But let's talk about the first ones. First one and the third one. And the reason for doing that is that the first one and the third one are exactly the conditions that we've looked at before. I don't want to make you sick by going back through here, but they're exactly these two cases here. So in one case, you turn it on upstream, you have this smear zone, it dissolves so slowly that you have stuff flowing through it that it's there for decades, centuries maybe, because it's only being dissolved in very small concentrations but it's being carried downstream and it exists there forever as a source. So the other one is where you take some water, salt dissolved in water, and you inject it into the ground and then go away. And so this would be where, for instance, if you had this smear zone, the first day of water that goes through it completely dissolves it and it's gone. The source is no longer there anymore. So those are the two end member conditions that we can look at. And if we look at those end member conditions, we can get solutions for them. And so, why, why screw around? Why not cut right to the chase and say something about it? So this is basically the idea. So this is our core that we have here. The x direction is downstream. This is where we have our source. And so it directly represents our aquifer. Uh, we have a fluid going through here at some advective velocity. And we choose some location where we're going to measure the concentration. So we're interested to know what the concentration is relative to the upstream, the boundary condition concentration. It's always convenient for us just to look at the ratio of these normalized concentrations because we know that by thermodynamics, the concentration can't accumulate in some locations. So it always has to be less than or equal to 1. And it could be so it varies between 0 and 1 at the range of here. And so you know that C over C0 would vary between 1 and 0, even though the relative concentration would be a, a, could be a large finite value. And if we solve uh, the advection dispersion equation, if we solve this equation for these appropriate boundary conditions, which we're not going to do, then we can quote the result, which is this. A bit complicated. So what does the math say? The math says the concentration in the aquifer starts off at zero concentration everywhere at time zero. This is t equals zero. At um, x equals zero, from time greater than zero, we turn it on to equal this magnitude. So that means this. So it equals zero at the upstream, at x equals zero, which is the upstream location. We turn it on so the concentration at time zero plus is equal to C zero, and keep it at that magnitude. That's this term here. And as you go down range, as x goes to infinity, then there is no concentration because it hasn't reached there. And that's all this is saying. And it never gets the concentration. It always stays zero because it's so far away, it never gets there. It doesn't matter. But the bottom line is that the solution to this is this kind of complicated uh, figure here, which we can mess around with. And it says that the concentration at some location L, 
So the concentration at this point here is equal to this. So this is the number we want to calculate. If we wanted to, we could divide both sides through by C0, which would be convenient, because now this would be 1, and this number would always be between 0 and 1. It makes it easier to plot. And you can always multiply it by the initial concentration to get it back again, right? And we have a couple of terms. This is dispersion. This is time since we started. This is how quickly it's going. And this is how far downstream we are. Those are the only variables. So I guess there are four variables. How far downstream we are, when we take the snapshot, and two physical properties. How fast it's flowing, and how much the dispersion is. We can always get the dispersion as this value here, right? If we wanted to. But we'll typically assume it's just some single number. We just talked about this before. And we can make life easy for us by defining two non-dimensional variables which are just groupings of these four parameters. The four parameters, I guess I'll list them. Length and time are what we prescribe for our problem. How far downstream and at what, how many days. And the physical properties that describe our system would be advective velocity and dispersion. So we could take these, and actually we could do Buckingham Pi with them if you wanted to. And if we did that, um, we know how many variables we get out of it. Shall we do that? <laughs> no thanks? Come on, are you kidding me? What's, yeah. what are the, how many variables will describe our system, I guess? So we remember we have k minus, I wasn't going to do this, but just since you said no, I'm going to do it. Uh, the number of variables we'll have would be the number of parameters, right? The number of parameters are four, and the number of dimensions that are represented. Mass, length, and time. Ma uh, length is there. Time is there. Length and time are velocity. And this is length and time. So actually we only have two. We have length and time represented. We don't have mass. Mass would turn up in concentration. Actually we do have the other one. Let's ignore it. Concentration exists, which is mass per unit volume. So we do. But if we ignore concentration, we actually have five variables, right? Not four. But if we assume we only have four, then we have mass and length represented. So that means we have two dimensionless groups. Plus C over C0. And the two-dimensional groups, we could do it by back and by, but we won't do that. But we could just group them based on um, trial and error. And the two groups are this. One which is called the, the Peclé number, which I bet you, well, we might have been mentioned in 303. Lots of these terms like Reynolds number. Reynolds number is the ratio of inertial to viscous forces. Euler number is... Um, pressure forces to inertial forces. The Peclé number is the ratio of the advective flux. Whoops, flux. To the diffusive flux or dispersive flux. And so, in other words, um, you could imagine that it would affect this dispersion parameter. So in other words, when the Peclé number goes to zero, then diffusion, chemical diffusion, is a big process, an important process, the main process in the system. And advective dis and mechanical mixing is trivial. Conversely, when Peclé number um, is much greater than one, 
one because when the ratio of one is they're roughly the same uh, is much greater than one then the term alpha L times V alpha is the big term and mechanical this me mechanical mixing dominates and I know there's not much space for me to write this and I'm not going to so this would be if you like this would be in clays which you use for liners or barriers Almost all the transport in clay bar barriers is by diffusion there's, because there's no velocity of the fluid in there. And this would be, the, the bottom one would be in sands. Okay. where the, It's basically controlled by the velocity. So in other words, you can think about this. When the velocity equals zero, then by definition, this term will be zero and this term will be zero. And so you'd expect that diffusion is the only process that exists because the other ones don't. When the velocity is big, the question is big, how big is big? Well, big in comparison to dispersion, then all of a sudden this term must dominate. This must be bigger than this term, and you'd expect that dispersion would be the main term. So Peclet number, there's an accent on there, I don't know where it goes. Peclet resume resume. Who speaks French here? Anybody? No one's going to admit to it anyway. <laughs> well, just because I knew they were going to get questions from me, it wasn't any kind of statement other than that, of course. <laughs> um, okay, so Peclet number is uh, this. Velocity, some length scale. Length scale being the length of our core in this particular case. And a number which represents pore volumes, uh, which is this T sub R. And this is again a velocity. This is the time that we've taken and a length. And why is it numbers of pore volumes? This is the advective velocity again. Um, and why is it number of pore volumes? Well, advective velocity is Darcy velocity. I'm not sure if I can do this divided by porosity. Velocity is equal to length over time by definition. So this is length over time. So this is uh, so this is equal to Yeah, let's not do that. Well, yeah, let's do that. Ignore the fact that I just said that uh, let's make that Darcy velocity. Let's not, because I think it's wrong. Because I think it's just more straightforward. And if we notice that this is advective velocity times time divided by length, then by definition, this term here is equal to 1 over velocity. advective velocity divided by 1 over advective velocity. Yeah, fine. Which is much easier. Which is equal to one. Advective velocity divided by advective velocity. So I guess there's not much intuitive insight in this. But poor volumes means that now if you if you let the fluid run for one day, and if at the end of one day the stuff that you put in at the upstream end is coming out of the bottom of your core, clearly the stuff that's coming out of the bottom of the core has displaced all the previous pore volume that's in your pore, in your core. And so if it has traveled with the vector velocity of whatever is the vector velocity in the system, and it's gone that particular length over the time that you run it, it's actually squeezed out one full pore volume. So the meaning of this pore volumes is when TR is equal to one, it means it's squeezed out, completely replaced one pore volume in the core. If you've, if it's half a pore volume, then the plume is only halfway down the length of the core. If it's two times it, then it's replaced it twice over. And so it's a convenient number to use because you'd expect that as you've replaced one pore volume, 
the front of the um, contaminant front would have just reached your compliance point that is now starting to drip out of the end. And so if you drew a graph of the residence time distribution with time, you'd expect that at one pore volume and its plug flow, all of a sudden your concentration goes up to one, right? Because it's just reached. So that's the reason that we might be interested in talking about pore volumes. All right. So if we have this expression, we can define this expression in terms of uniquely in terms of these two non-dimensional parameters. You can check the dimensions to your own satisfaction that they are dimensionless. Has to be right. This is a velocity. This is one over velocity. Proven. If we replace these terms into this upper equation, we get this lower equation. If we plot this lower equation, even though you can't see it here, then the equation, well, let me draw it out just because it's I can. I'm going to draw the rest of this out. It's important. And it's easier. I know I'm a genius. <laughs> Very interesting. Well, I'm doing is zooming in. Okay, so we'll do this. So this is a graph of this expression here. This is if we put, for instance, a magnitude of a dispersion coefficient in here, which is zero, or a value of velocity, which is large in comparison to that value, the curve that we get would look like this. And it would represent the value of this Peclet number, which is equal to a very big number. If we progressively increase the magnitude of dispersion, or decrease the velocity. Either way, we'd start getting an expression that would look now like these moved over values here. So this is a Peclet number of infinity. This is a value of 100. And so if you wanted to think about what those look like in terms of this relationship here, we go back to it. Remember, this is what it looks like in the aquifer. So this is our core that ends up at this, this length here. Here is L. And this is our uh, front moving through. We talked last time about drawing the residence time distribution, which is differently. But this sharp front and these um, diffused fronts are just functions of this. So this is a Peclet number equal to infinity. I'm going to go back to the other one. And this is a Peclet number less than infinity. So, And if we drew the residence sign distribution curve for something arriving at this point, then we'd end up with the curve that we just looked at on the previous page. TR going through 1, C over C0, 1. And it does this for plug flow. And does this for different right? So this is the RTD. And so now we have a way of being able to, to do that. Uh, if we go through here. Okay. And that's it. And so the power of using these non-dimensional parameters is that you end up with one curve characterizes every single realization of the aquifer you could ever have for this very simple geometry that you have uniform velocity, one dimension, no lateral dispersion, but longitudinal dispersion. You end up with one set, set of curves. And those are the curves that are plotted out in um, Fetter's book, which I think exists somewhere in here. Actually, they're before this. Let's see, it's out of sequence. So this curve comes directly out of Fetter's book. And so let you get orient, orient yourself on this. Relative concentration, maximum value of 1, minimum value of 0 on the left axis. This is pore volumes on the bottom. This is T sub r. What was the equation for T sub r? It was advective velocity divided by uh, length 
over time, by definition. And so if you look at the magnitudes for this, then you see something, it's kind of a complicated figure because there's a, there are three different solutions plotted on here. But let's just look at the ones that I'm going to do in, in boldface. So first of all, if I can do this, not very well. This red line here represents Peclet number equal infinity. The one that's hard lined here, and I draw it down here, along with some others for slightly different boundary conditions, is 100 right here. 10 is this one here. And just so I can differentiate it, uh, one, one is here. And these for our um, type one boundary conditions. I saw that twitch. That was a wake up twitch, wasn't it? So these are the ones that we've been looking at. So this is the constant source that exists forever. And so the only important, well, there are a number of interesting parts of this, right? One is that this is useful because we know this is really easy to calculate, right? We, if we know this, we know that this is 1. So if we know that this is equal to 1, this is exactly the expression that you've been using to calculate how long does it take to get downstream if you're 30 kilometers downstream and the advective velocity you know. Right? That's exactly the expression that you use to do that. But that works OK for this. It actually works pretty well for this as well, because if you look at the 50% mark as you go across here, they kind of go through that point, but not quite. It doesn't actually work so well if you can see this. I, I'm not sure what you can see up here. But it doesn't work so well for the uh, 10, which is this one. And it really doesn't work very well for the 1 at all, which is this one here where the, the actual crossover value is 0 0.45. So in other words, if you wanted to calculate the arrival time of 50% concentration, you, couldn't, you wouldn't get the right answer if you used your uh, equation, because instead of 1, you'd have to use a different value here. And so the significant part of this is that well, it's fine to do the things that you've done and to know when you and to realize you can use them, but you should also realize when you can't do them. And in a physical sense, when shouldn't you do it? What are the physical reasons of not wanting to do it? Okay. This represents only advection, right? The only component being represented here is advection. And so where you can't use that expression is where the transport process has nothing to do with advection, advection at all. The time when it won't have anything to do with advection is where it's controlled completely by diffusion. And so in other words, when the dispersion coefficient defined by these properties, in other words, when the velocity is zero, when the velocity is zero, this actually has no meaning, right? Because you can't gauge time because zero in here, I'm not sure where it puts you on this axis. And so, it's, it's, so in other words, this only works down. So you can remember this number. Probably the best number to remember here is it seems to work OK to a Peclet number of 10. So in other words, using this is OK if the flow velocity is large enough that the Peclet number is greater than or equal to 10. And in other words, Peclet number was, let's not be doing that, is velocity times length times dispersion. Yeah. So this is a property of the aquifer. 
This is the velocity that we think we know. And this is actually the size of the plume, as it turns out, for other reasons that we've said. And so you could turn out when you, you can figure out when you can use or when you can't use uh, this quick and dirty method of being able to get access to how far something might have gone or how uh, or when it might arrive. Um, so with that, un if you use this expression that you have here, that you've used already in a couple of assignments, at least one assignment, the first assignment you did, would it underestimate or overestimate the arrival time? Would it tell you it's going to arrive later or earlier than it really does? It would tell you if... Let me sort of, i got to wrap my head around this as well. So your calculation, if, if the velocity was zero, would be that it would never arrive. And so it would suggest to you that it would arrive much later than it would do in practice, which is what you said. I don't know what your logic was, but that's the logic that we have to look at. And so in other words, if it's one poor volume, if you use, if you know that there's no velocity in the system, um, then if you have no velocity in the system, then it would tell you that it would arrive at, uh, actually, would it tell you that it would arrive at time zero? It would, wouldn't it? So if you make this equal to um, t is equal to length over velocity, yeah. So if the velocity is zero, it would tell you to arrive at time infinity and beyond. And um, what's it doing? So do you post-date or predate Buzz Lightyear? Yeah, it must be about the same time. About the same time, yeah. When you're very young, of course, because you wouldn't be watching that now. I just saw Toy Story three. Then. Is that right? Yeah. Was there three? God, I don't know how they got three out of that. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> is that a recommendation, or is that to it stay away? Well, it's incredible. It, it ends up perfect with our age group. So yeah, first and third are good. I think I've seen the first. I don't know about the other two. Anyway, so buyer beware in terms of this. So that's explaining exactly what's going on. So. That's useful. I think that's useful to know. So that's the, I'd say that's the punchline for what we're talking about today, is that you need to be aware of uh, what these expressions are. If you want to, you can calculate exactly what they turn out to be. Actually, I put this down here. I don't know. We did this yesterday. That's not a yawn, is it? So this is it. So you can plot them. So you can take that equation and you can use MATLAB or whatever you want to use. But you get a relationship which if uh, your Peclet number is a big number, doesn't it like? Don't know why it doesn't like it. Did it do it for 100? Oh, well, that puts pay to that if that won't work. Nothing to plot. Well, we don't need to go down that road then. So, that was easy. <laughs> it worked before. The best laid plans. So, uh, so this final figure here, I think, is, is an important one. If I, so that's exactly what we're trying to explain on that other figure. The fact that the important part is that this component here is no longer the 50% mass part is no longer at TR's uh, one poor volume. It was actually equal to 0.45. So that's the point. Likewise, if you look at the behavior for another boundary condition, and the other boundary condition that we've talked about 
is something like this. This is the, the spike upstream. So this is the rate at which you put it into the ground, and then you turn it on, and then you turn it off. Then you know it's going to be a spike that moves downstream. If you look at what it looks like in the aquifer, then if you look at plotting it versus location versus C over C0 for 1, then at some stages, this would be for a dispersion coefficient of 1. progressively larger ones, right? Let's be more dispersed. And so the expression for this, same parameters, Peclet number and pore volume. You can do it. You can write your own code to do whatever you wish. And those, those exist. And those exist in Fedder. So those are probably the two um, more important um, relationships to be able to reproduce. It's fine for us to be able to use the graph values and if you didn't believe it before, the reason why you might want to be interested in dimensionless numbers is it allows you to be able to make one figure that takes care of all of these cases. Very, very powerful engineering technique for doing experiments, the minimum number of experiments, the, the minimum number of plots that shows exactly uh, how your system behaves. So. The other way to look at this, um, Instead of so so far, the systems that we've looked at have only been exploring flow in a core. And by definition, if you flow within a core, and you imagine what the uh, tracking along uh, from, say, this particle of ink that you have here, it will merrily go downstream and come out at the bottom. If you have a particle of ink next door to it, then presumably, if you ignore dispersion, it would kind of track down here right next to it as well. If you have one right next door to that, they would also track next door to it and come out of the bottom. And so the fact that on this uh, upstream boundary, we apply a uniform concentration means as you go downstream, as you you're this particle going downstream. If you look to your left and to your right, you'll be exactly at the same concentration next door to you. And so there is no dispersion that occurs across because it's a uniform front moving down that goes right the way across the width of this core. So there is no lateral dispersion. So the processes that we've looked at in the core, because it's one-dimensional, it doesn't have this second uh, feature of lateral spreading included. And as we alluded to before, right at the beginning of what we're talking about today, when we talked about what the equations might be that we're messing around with, is that if you look in plan view, this feature that a plume gets wider as it spreads might be a feature that's of interest to us. Uh, one, because if you have a well that's over here, you might want to know whether by the time it gets down here, it's spread out wide enough that it actually is a problem. Or is it just a nice longitudinal part here that kind of misses you? Um, and also, for what we said before about the physics of this, and that is, if you look at this manifestation of the, the skyline moving down gradient uh, with respect to concentration, we'd expect that the integral of this area, the area under this curve, is really the mass of stuff that's in the plume. And so that if it spreads, then the mass is still the same, and therefore the height of this has to be reduced. So the, the concentration is reduced, but its concentration is reduced by spreading it out further wide. So in other words, we're interested in lateral spreading, because if it isn't able to spread laterally, then we'd expect it to be quite concentrated in the plume. If it is able to spread out laterally, then we'd expect that the concentrations in the heart of the plume might actually be reduced because it's the same mass that we're dealing with. So those are the two reasons that you might be curious as to whether it spreads out or not. And so what we can do is we can get a solution that includes this lateral spreading. And uh, it's in a physical sense, it's relatively straightforward. 
The idea is basically this. You take your uh, drop of uh, ink and you drop it in the aquifer at time zero. It's the same as dropping ink in your beaker, but the beaker has sand soil in it. You allow the beaker to move downstream some length. That's the advective length. In time t, it travels a length x is equal to velocity times time, right? All these things start recurring. So this, so vt, x is equal to vt. Length over time times time is a length. So the location it travels down in a given time, if it's going at some advective velocity, is the beaker is now here. In the time the beaker has gone from upstream to downstream, it's diffused. It's either diffused in the beaker by um, chemical diffusion, or if it's had to actually flow on this tortuous flow path as it goes down here, it's mechanically dispersed. Both of the features that are embodied in this dispersion term, right? DL is equal to the diffusion, chemical diffusion, plus lateral mechanical mixing. Oops. Vx. And so that's physically what it is. So if we know that if you leave the, um, the ink in the beaker, that the profile of that ink looks like a Gaussian, the bell curve, you know, the gradient curve, then we could use that solution together with the translation part to be able to calculate exactly what that solution would be. And it turns out that the solution is exactly this term here. This, this looks kind of complicated, but if you look at it, this term here Initial location plus how far it's gone down range. This is the length it's traveled, this term here. And so you can think of it, well, yeah, let's not get over, overthink it. Basically, that's the idea. Start off at this point here, drop it in, it diffuses or disperses as it affects downstream. So this grows as it gets larger. As it gets to this point here, it's going to be even bigger gets to this point here, it's going to be huge. Not following politics? No? Come on. You guys are too busy playing. Isn't that the Donald Trump thing? We got a huge lead in uh, Iowa. It wasn't uh, Bernie Sanders uh, mimicking it the other day? He says huge as well. It's New York accent. All right, so this is what it is. So this is this expression that we have here. Is This is the mass that's put in. This is a certain amount of dispersion. And this is kind of uh, an idea of the length of the limbs. So now if you think about it, this, this basically gives you um, a plume that looks like this. This value of uppercase X is this. This value of uppercase Y is this. And Z is into the, the page. And so really it's just coordinates relative to where you are in the center of, of this plume. That, that's all. And so what it allows you to do is be able to plot the plume as it goes downrange. And the, the one... So what you could do, for instance, is you can either define the plume relative to x and y coordinates in the global system. So the global system is here. So this is x0, this is this point here is 0, 0. This is whatever the x and y coordinates are of the initial point. And this would be the x and y coordinates of the point where you want to find the concentration at a particular time. So this would be x and y. So x0, y0, where the, the plume is in, introduced relative to the origin, and this is where you measure it. And if you do that, then this equation will give you the concentration at the location you want to know and the time at which you want to know it based on this. You just need to put the numbers in. 
if instead of writing the equation this way, you think of yourself as sitting in this particular location here, where this is the location 0, 0, and measure your coordinates relative to that position, then this is the concentration at that point. Just an easier way to do it. It's a useful way to do it because if you take this now and write your coordinates for the place where you'd be if you traveled downstream at the advective velocity of the plume, then your x value would be 0, your y value would be 0, and your z value would be 0, right? Because you'd be sitting here, by definition. And if that's the case, then the exponential of 0, I think, is 1. And so this whole term becomes 0. So in other words, if, if um, x equals y equals z, big Z, all of these are big, equals 0, then this whole term here is equal to 0, and then this term here is equal to 1. If this is equal to 1, then what does it give you? It gives you the concentration of the middle of your plume as a function of how, much, how many kilograms of stuff you put into the ground. You know this, hopefully. Uh, you, know what, you might know what these values are. And so you can calculate what the concentration is at any particular time. So, so that's the, the, maybe the first take on the, yeah. If the particle was diffusing out as it went down, wouldn't it, like, if you were in the center, wouldn't it be less as a result of the spreading? It is. And so if you look at this, then the concentration with time, good point, is going to be equal to the total mass, which is going to be constant, multiplied by these terms on the bottom, t to the 3 over 2. And the other terms in the bracket, these are going to be constant. Right. So this term will uh, get larger, and this will be constant, and so the concentration will go down. Yeah. So, so the loss isn't the factor of the exponent at all. It's, that's just the location. This is just a convenient way to be able to think about it. So if you choose the middle of your plume, these terms will go to 0. And if those go to 0, this exponential term goes to 1. And if that goes to 1, then you're left with the concentration being defined only by this term in green. Easy way to do it. And it will, as you allude to, uh, look exactly like this. That it starts off that there's a whole bunch of stuff underneath here and a high concentration. But as it spreads out, by definition, since it's the same mass, this has to be low in the physical sense. So that's the first part, is you can get the concentration at the middle of your plume to the maximum concentration if you know what the mass is. The first part. And I guess if you know what the concentration is when you first put it in, then that defines your mass for you. The other thing is that because this is the bell curve, and the bell curve you can define well, in terms of a standard deviation, then if you look at the location where The mass, so, so the other words, the population that includes, I think it's 99.7%. Stop it. So 99% of the area under this curve is included in the area that are within three standard deviations. One standard deviation, what is it? Is it 66% or something? 67? So one sigma is this horizontal area is 66% of the area. That's just the definition. So it means that if you have three standard deviations, you think that you're including all the information. In. So you want to have, when physicists look for five standard deviations on Higgs boson, it means that they want to be really certain about their result, that all their information is within the, the, the spread. And so if we look for three standard deviations, because this is a Gaussian distribution, that means that that defines this particular length if you think of this as the x-coordinate. It's kind of cut off here, but this is the big x-coordinate. And so one feature of a standard deviation curve is that this length, which is three standard deviations, which you could think of as the edge of your plume, the minimum concentration, if you can find that, 
then you can always, oh yeah, I guess it's 99.7. Then the length that includes th three standard deviations is equal to a physical property. It's equal to three times the square root of two times the dispersion times time, this term here. And so the idea is, if you can go out in the field, you can stick down some wells or piezometers, you can measure exactly what your plume looks like at 372 days, then you know when the plume was measured. If you know how big the plume was, because three standard deviations is this length, so you have this. The only thing you don't have is this. And so you can calculate d l is equal to d star plus alpha b epic. So depending on what you don't know, maybe if you think you know this, because we think we can relate alpha is proportional to the length of the plume divided by 10. You know how big the plume is, so maybe you know that. Maybe you can calculate the vector velocity for it. But the bottom line is you can calculate what the dispersion of your system is. And so typically, if you can measure the plume, you could figure out exactly what dispersion was. Actually, if you think you know what dispersion was, and you want to know what the plume looks like after 372 days, you calculate, one, what the half length of it would be, and you also know where it was, because it, how far would it be downrange? It would be a length, L is equal to the advector velocity, Two, two modalities. You know you have a spill. You like to know what the effect is. Get some estimate of dispersion. Get some measurement of advective velocity. And if you have that, you can calculate where the center of mass would be from this. And you could calculate how big this length in each direction would be from this. That's one way to do it. If you go into the field and you measure a big mass in situ. In other words, you put a hole in here, and you measure concentrations at all these different points, so you get a pretty good idea of what this looks like. Then you could get from that uh, a magnitude of dispersion. If you knew how long, or if you, if you could estimate dispersion, and you could measure this, you could estimate, for instance, how long it's been traveling. And if you know how long it's been traveling, and you know what the measured advective velocity is, you could figure out what the source region might be, either up here, or it could be the same direction, dimension in the other direction. Right? You don't know which direction. But you know from the cigar shape that because it's ex extended in the direction it's traveling, that it's got to be either upstream of it or downstream. You don't know which way it's traveling. But I guess if you knew that the advective velocity was positive in this direction, it's probably not this point here. So two modalities.